Hello, everyone. My name is Jeff Green. I'm the director of the Andrea Mitchell Center. I want to welcome you here today for our event on capitalism and labor. We're very pleased to be concluding our series on capitalism, socialism, and democracy for this year, although we'll be back next year with that series as well. And indeed, today is also the last event of the Mitchell Center's programming for the 2020-21 academic year. So it's a milestone on that front as well. I want to thank everyone who's been involved with the center this past year. Above all, our numerous participants, invited guests, and speakers who have been with us, the scholars, the students, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, uh, whose work has so enlivened the intellectual climate of our center over the past year, the organizers who have worked behind the scenes to put on all of our events. And here I must single out Matt Roth, who's been involved with virtually every event we've put on this year. And I want to thank you, the audience, for tuning in, in spite of all the obvious challenges this past year, and participating in a new way, a way that has had some sacrifices attached to it, but also has had some benefits in terms of reaching as many or more people and people around the world. And we look forward to including as many of you as possible next year, as we hopefully transition to having more, if not most, of our events back in person. Um, one of the true bright spots of this year has been the Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy Initiative. We've had a handful of very uh, smart, well-attended, dynamic events on diverse, important topics. And someone who's really been uh, in large degree responsible for the success of this initiative is Miranda Sklaroff, who will be our moderator today and who was the moderator at our most recent Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy event on climate reparations. So Miranda, thank you for all the work you've been doing on this series. It's been a pleasure collaborating with you. And I'll turn things over to you. Thanks a lot. Um, great. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that wonderful, or Professor Green, for that wonderful introduction, I should say. Um, uh, so welcome to Work Won't Love You Back, How Capitalism Exploits Labors of Love. And um, as Professor Green said, it's this is part of the Andrea Mitchell Center for Democracies series, Capitalism, Socialism, Democracy. And my name is Miranda Edith Scaroff, and I'm a PhD student in the Penn Political Science Department. Uh, today, I'm joined by labor journalist Sarah Jaffe, whose new book, Won't Work Won't Love You Back, uh, was published in January 2021 by Bold Type Books. Jaffe is a Type Media Center fellow and an independent journalist covering the politics of power from the workplace to the streets. She's the author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt, and her work has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, The Guardian, The Washington Post, The New York Republic, The American Prospect, and many other publications. She is the co-host with Michelle Chen of Descent Magazine's Belabored podcast, as well as a columnist at the Progressive and New Labor Forum. Jaffe's newest book is a rich telling of the most recent reincarnation of the spirit of capitalism, the idea that one can and should love their work in various ways. From domestic work to the shelves of Toys R Us to professional athletes to the new professoriate, um, Jeff, Jaffe reveals how we are all harmed by this deliberate blurring of work, love, and passion. So today, um, I'll start our conversation for about 45 minutes with some questions for Sarah, and then we'll um, open it up from questions from the audience. Um, so um, Sarah, unless you have anything that you want to start us off with, um, uh, and I'll just go straight into questions. So I write in. Okay. I'm, thank you so much for this wonderful book. It really um, I think feel like wide ranging is often used in marketing copy and I myself has used it sometimes, but it's actually very rarely true. And this book is like both wide ranging and deep. And so thank you so much for it. And it really does come pretty to me as someone who's followed your work for a long time, really come out of your sort of labor report, like reportage and like um, your, your, your work. Um, and your sort of constant rethinking of, of the parameters of work and home and love. And so what made you write this book, you know, at sort of in the late 2010s, um, in particular, um, since it seems like this has been sort of an undercurrent in, in, in your work previously? Yeah, this has been a book that has lived in the back of my mind for um, most of the last 10 years. And I actually, when Necessary Trouble came out, that was the summer of 2016. And I figured I would do book launch and then I would turn around and write the next proposal and write this book then. And then we had an election and Donald Trump happened. And I figured I had to go be a reporter and be sort of more um, immediately in 
the thick of things rather than doing, you know, what it takes to write a book is, is sort of deliberately stepping away from the news cycle and saying, I'm going to work really hard on a thing that nobody's going to see for two years. And it took me a while to actually like get to a point where I felt like I could do that. And, um, Honestly, one of the things that happened is that there's a lot of great young labor reporters now who are doing what I would have been doing. And so I don't feel like I have to do everything. I've got to shout out like Kim Kelly and Alex Press um, and so many other people who are doing a great job on a beat that I used to be on with like two other people. Um, so I, you know, I took a little while and while that was happening, there's also just been an explosion of organizing and striking in these fields that I was already writing about and that were already, you know, percolating. Like teachers were already the, you know, at the forefront of the labor movement. But in 2018, the wave of strikes that we saw was, you know, I certainly didn't expect. Um, and I had been covering this for a really long time and, and, you know, and the wave of organizing at like art museums, like the Philadelphia Art Museum, um, where my brother-in-law works and is a member of the union, um, the, you know, the resurgence of grad worker organizing, I'm sure we can talk about that plenty, um, because right, NYU grad workers are on strike right now. Um, there have been all sorts of other actions around the country, and I'm not going to try to name them all because I'll forget them all. But so there has been a real... Um, awakening, like the New Yorker magazine might be on strike this time next week. Um, so the laborers of love have had enough. And then literally, as I finished writing the book, I turned it in at the end of last February. And then what happened? We all went into global lockdown. Um, and work got worse for everybody, basically, right? Unless you're Donald Trump. Um, yeah, it even got worse for him. Um, and so I had to sort of go back to everybody that I had interviewed for the book and say like, uh, so, hey, so how has your work life changed now that you're locked in your house or you're still going to work or you are worried that you're about to be laid off? Um, all of these, you know, possibilities for, for work that basically, you know, the, the broad strokes of the workforce of the last three years have been you're either fired or you're going into your job and it's just 10 times more dangerous than it used to be, or you're doing it all from like this corner of your room. So all of those things um, sort of added up to, I think this book still, you know, it's been out for a few months and there's 92 of you on this call. Thank you all for being here. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not that common for the thing to sort of have a life in this way. So I, I really feel like whatever struggles I have with the timing, it's ended up being exactly the right time. Yeah, I should say one thing that um, this book does is I was sort of expecting like maybe an afterword about the pandemic, but um, when I first got it, but you've really woven in the sort of, and you know, I think one of the interesting things is how much the pandemic has changed things and how much things are left the same too, like, you know, more intense, but like same type, like same um, same types of fights. Yeah. So um, one thing I, um, I think for those who haven't read it yet, um, I think is uh, one of the most exciting parts of this book is while it's a book about work, it's also about anti-work. And it's also about a sort of an anti-work politics that I think sort of um, is, is, is sort of below the surface. And so by anti-work, you know, I mean something sort of like a kind of politics that wants to change the very nature of how we think about work, generally wants us to do less of it, and wants us to think about the work that we actually require. So I was just curious about what your sort of, how you, um, if, if how you think about anti-work politics and how that formed or didn't form um, some of, some of um, the sort of way the book is specifically sort of like organized and, and the theoretical um, ties that hold it together. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, when I started out trying to be a labor journalist, it was kind of like there weren't very many people doing it. There was there was Liza Featherstone, there was Barbara Ehrenreich, of course. Um, and so I sort of jumped into this thing and trying to write about unions and organizing and all of this stuff in, in a way that, you know, was sort of shaped by the discourse of unions in the U.S. in the last 20, 30 years, which is basically like, jobs are good, we need more of them, we need to save them, we need to create them, we need to fight for them, and we need to make them better. But all of it sort of revolves around this assumption that, that jobs are a necessary and good thing 
to have in the world. And I, you know, I, I, like many people read Kathy Weeks's book, The Problem with Work and went like, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, what if we thought about this totally differently? You know, and I, I had, a, you know, done a lot of reading in various strains of, of left and Marxist thought over, you know, the decades before I, I stumbled upon uh, Dr. Weeks. And that, you know, that book sort of made me go like, oh my God, there's a whole other world out here. And it's, um, you know, I mean, she references wages for housework. I ended up doing a lot of reading of Sylvia Federici, um, somewhere around the same, actually, yeah, a little bit earlier than the Kathy Weeks book, actually, um, I had read Selma James's collection. Um, and so sort of discovered this, this framework of thinking of wages for housework. Um, and the way that this um, analysis of, of both like that work is a more expansive thing than the job that you may go to, um, the job that the labor movement is talking about a lot of the time, and also that maybe it's not at all natural that we do it this much and that we look to find meaning in it. And like, you know, I spent 10 years of my life working in restaurants and retail, so I know that not all work is meaningful very deeply um, from very personal experience. <laughs> and one of the things that was the most interesting was like when I got finally got to a point where I could do journalism full time and it was really my job and I wasn't um, a, you know, waitress who was also trying mightily to do journalism. Um, the challenges didn't go away. And a lot of the ways that my bosses treated me were exactly the same down to the sexual harassment. And so all of that sort of, you know, boils over into this book, I think, right? Um, everything from the experience of, of reading all of this theoretical work that had been done by Marxist feminists for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. And also having gotten to my dream career and found out that work still sucks. Um, yeah, I think that we have talked about this before, but Kathy Weeks's book, The Problem with Work, does end up being, I think, a lot of people's touchstones. But even, you know, I think that this is something that gets, that in many ways has been taken up um, by a lot of people before her and now after her. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you know, um, I think it's often sort of opposed to workerism, but often it has a vision of work that, like, includes the labor movement. So that yeah. sometimes it gets cast as sort of more intention um, with that than it needs to be. So I guess that's, this just jumps to like a different kind of question I have, which is like, how, what do you see the role of unions in the labor movement? So your book is actually, you interview a lot of unorganized mm -hmm. workers um, and people whose jobs are either have been historically left out by a lot of sort of um, the, the, the legal benefits of, 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 of unionization and also people who might be sort of um, just in a career that isn't, uh, that hasn't needed unions in the same way, you know. I, I, I almost hesitate to say that with academia, but academia needs a union. <laughs> Everyone has always needed a union, but maybe, but yeah. maybe this, that this sort of awareness is not there yet. Mm -hmm. So, what? Yeah. So, how do you sort of think about unions and their role and sort of like the future of the of the uh, labor movement? Um, and like, again, that's a really big question. But one thing that came out is that of the book is that a lot of these, a lot of the people don't have that you talk to don't have unions. And so is the solution more unions? Is the solution unions yes. and rethinking? Yeah, like, <laughs> like how, what, what, what would you say the answer to Yeah, that? I mean, the solution is always more unions. Um, but it's also, um, one of the things is like every worker whose story I tell in the book is somebody who is like involved in organizing in their work in some way, even the, the you know, woman that I profile that is a single mom is organizing around being a single mom. She also has, a, you know, paid job, but like she does organize with other single parents around the needs that they have. And she also organizes around universal basic income. Um, and there, you know, she can't unionize because she doesn't have a boss because she's a single mom, but she can do a whole lot of political work and, and really incredible political organizing um, and in really interesting and creative ways. So um, Ray is an artist. She's a theater person. So a lot of her organizing work is also um, really creative. And so she'll have, you know, 
sort of an, a space where she's bringing parents together to talk about their needs and to talk about what solutions might be. But while they're doing that, they're doing crafts and things that, and she's like, you know, it actually makes people more willing and comfortable talking. Because when you, somebody comes into a room and you're like, so are you, you know, are you on your universal credit? She's in the UK. You know, people go like, that's none of your business. But after 20 minutes of, of you know, sewing crafts together, they, people sort of warm up to each other in a different way. So, you know, I think a lot of labor unions would roll their eyes at this, right? But I think it's great. And it's a way to bring people together that might not have come to a meeting that was called explicitly, like, we're organizing a union of parents or whatever it might be. Um, you know, Anne Marie, um, who was the worker at Toys R Us that I profiled, who actually, um, Anne Marie passed away from COVID-19 two months ago. So um, I always have to sort of say that because like the face of people who have gotten sick and died of this virus is frontline retail workers among other people, right? So um, Anne Marie worked at Toys R Us for 30 years. And then all of a sudden, because of Bain Capital and its, you know, Vulture Buddies, Toys R Us went bankrupt and the workers were going to get nothing. And so, you know, it wouldn't have been any good to unionize a company that was going out of business, but they did organize as workers and challenge and demand um, something severance right and changed the law in several places got meetings with members of congress like really did um raise some hell as workers who had been part of building this company and who had created a whole lot of value for this company so um you know i think that stuff is is really really interesting and then there are people in the book who are you know like rosa jimenez who's a teacher in los angeles um who is um is a really involved in building the union and also in organizing alongside her students um they're the video games workers in the uk who have formed like an official union of video games workers one of the first ones in the world so there is sort of all sorts of ways that people organize. I profile the interns in Quebec who went on massive strike, 30,000, 40,000 interns in the streets. Um, so, and I think all of these stories have something that more traditional unions could probably learn from, um, thinking about the different ways that these workers have come to understand themselves as workers through different types of organizing that maybe don't just happen on a shop floor. Um, great, thank you so much. That um, I think that was a, a great answer to a, um, to a question um, that, like, I think often sort of pits like unionized versus non-unionized workers and their benefits against each other sometimes. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I think in a sort of unnecessary way, maybe. So you tell a lot of different stories in this book, um, and uh, and you know I think right before we were um, the the event we were talking a little bit you know for instance that the nurses uh, you don't have a chapter on nurses but you do have one on teachers and and you were sort of doing a, a you know thinking about how to tell maybe a couple of different stories what other stories were like sort of like. Did any end up on the chopping block? Um, from, <laughs> yeah. Um, like what other, where, or you didn't have enough time or, or the sort of like right context, what, what stories didn't make it into this book? Didn't have enough words. My editor would have killed me if the book was any longer than it was. She already wanted it to be shorter. So we had like, we had some bargaining sessions, me and Katie, about what was gonna go into the book. Um, I wanted to have a chapter on musicians. And um, we ended up sort of sticking with the more traditional sort of fine artists art chapter, but I really wanted to talk about music. And then I've been actually trying to figure out a home for an article that I want to write that is like some version of this, but specifically after the pandemic, where most, you know, I mean, unless you're Beyonce, you don't make money from selling albums, right? If you are a professional musician, you make money from touring. And if you have not toured for a year, what are you do right and like there's been a lot of organizing around like save our stages but and and you know there have been some self-employment benefits and pandemic unemployment insurance and all of these things that have have tried to create a safety net for workers who don't have a traditional job but it's still a huge huge question and i think a lot about this um i used to be more of a pop culture reporter actually so i spent some time um writing about music and musicians and like 
got to know some people from some bands who basically tour, you know, 200 year, days out of the year. And yeah, I just, I thought about that a lot recently. Um, Nurse is definitely, I ended up writing a feature story for the nation um, that ended up basically being sort of the missing nurses chapter um, because of that. And of course, I'm just back from visiting the nurses in Worcester, Massachusetts, who have been on strike for 59 days as of today at St. Vincent Hospital, which is owned by Tenet, which is a for-profit hospital corporation. Um, and yeah, I mean, nurses' story is very similar in a lot of ways to the teacher's story in terms of the increasing union militancy in recent years um, and the way that they are leading in what we now call bargaining for the common good, which is bringing demands from the community to the bargaining table. So the nurses in um, at St. Vincent are still ho holding out, not for wages, but for staffing levels. So they want in their contract that each nurse has no more than four patients at a time because they say that having more patients and they keep getting more patients stacked on top of them um, that hurts their ability to provide care and so these kinds of things um, they're the demands that care workers bring to the table um, i did have an arts chapter and I did talk a little bit about art museum workers in there, but I would have loved to get into the art museum workers stuff even more. Um, and I could have had a journalist chapter and I kind of just didn't want to write about myself. But I actually was on a panel um, last night with some of the New Yorker and Pitchfork Union members who are organizing at Condé Nast right now and are, you know, again, potentially going to be on strike this week. They've taken a strike vote with 98% voting for a strike. Um, so, you know, there are sort of endless stories. And then I would, you know, every time I talked to somebody about this book while I was working on it, they were like, oh, I do this kind of work. And this totally fits. Um, librarians is a really interesting one that a lot of people have brought up to me since I've been talking about the book. So like endless, endless amounts of stories that could have gone into it. Um, what couldn't fit into it is a little bit <laughs> easier a topic. Um, so one thing that you also fit into this, and you know, I'm a feminist political theorist, so like one thing that delighted me in this book was um, how closely you linked remaking work with remaking the family or rethinking work with rethinking the family. And so you look at how the work of making a home, for instance, has been particularly gendered and racialized historically, as well as um, how, you know, the family wage was both the call to action for wage labor and a mechanism for strengthening the ideal of the family for those who live on one. Yeah. Um, so why is this such an important of thinking uh, aspect of thinking through labor politics for you today? Um, you know, I think it's so exciting to to see it start like you start almost start the book with this. And so, um, you know, because you're talking about sort of universal basic income in the UK. Um, and so, uh, you know, how, how do you how are you thinking about those things together? Yeah, I mean, I think the family is just such an important thing that not nearly enough people think critically about. We just sort of assume it's natural and it's definitely anything but natural. And um, I have been thinking about it even more in this past year, obviously, when like um, I've started to think about it as like Margaret Thatcher units, you know, that famous Margaret Thatcher line about their individual men and women and their families. And that's essentially how we've been forced to live in pandemic times. So I'm single. So I was, I was living with roommates for a little while and then basically I've just been alone. Um, and for other people who are, are, you know, balancing like kids being in virtual school with their own jobs, with their, you know, dealing with like whatever, it's like, you know, the two different ways you can be driven absolutely bonkers by pandemic life. Um, what's worse, having a family or not having a family, right? Um, all of this is, is so much more relevant, I think, than ever. And I also just like, we're in an intense moment of anxiety about gender and sexuality. Um, I mean, every time there's a new like gender reveal party that like, you know, bombs a house or causes an earthquake or gets eaten by an alligator. Um, all of those things have pretty much happened. I don't know if one's actually caused an earthquake, but they've definitely caused like massive damage. Um, I'm just like, wow, y'all are really scared about the fact that gender's not real you know, um, that all of these sort of edifices are crumbling. And part of the reason that the family is crumbling is that the family that we think of as natural was built on the family wage and was built on 
a man having a stable job and thus a wife at home. And that doesn't work anymore for all but a tiny number of people. Bill Gates even just got divorced. Bill Gates doesn't even have a wife at home anymore. Uh, you know, like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos can't even keep a wife. So like, we are really talking here about an institution that is falling apart. Um, and I think that's great. Um, I mean, I don't think it's great for people to be struggling to figure out how to live, and I'm certainly struggling to figure out how to live, but we have to deal with the fact that this thing isn't natural and that it is a style of work. And then one of the things that actually really surprised me when I was reporting the book was like, I expected care work jobs to be told that the workplace is like a family. I was really shocked that every single video game programmer was like, yeah, they tell us we're a family. Um, to the point of the company that brands itself as a fampany, which like is the worst thing I've ever heard. Um, that like everybody I think has had a boss tell them that we're just like a family around here. And like, you know, when Google is telling you it's a family, like guys, no. Um, and yeah, so it was even more striking than I expected it to be how much the family is a tool and a style and a sort of mechanism of coercing work. Um, great, thank you. So I actually, I'm, I, uh, I'm going to, if it's okay with the powers that be, actually jump over to some of the questions that we are getting because they are like excellent and I think that some of them are, are going to be um, uh, I think uh, really interesting, get, like, get some really interesting answers too. So the first one that I'm gonna pull out is, um, is uh, from Benjamin and he's asking, how is work defined in the context you discuss it? Is it something, is it the same thing as just paper or is it limited? Um, again, I think that this is actually uh, like, this is, ends up being like a very political theory question. Um, <laughs> yes, theory, you can like, probably like, answer it better than I can. Um, is, um, is, is, uh, is, uh, you know, um, you know, my spidey senses are tingling, but, uh, I'm going to give this one to Sarah. <laughs> yeah, um, no, I mean, I'm like entirely unqualified to do a political theory answer. I have a master's degree in journalism from Temple in Philadelphia on the other side of town. Um, and I am like, a you know, I'm wearing my little magpies around my neck because I joke that I'm an intellectual magpie and I just grab whatever is shiny. Um, so when I think about work and the reason that I start the book with the family is to sort of say that like work is not just something that you get paid for. Um, so I don't, you know, it's often easier to say what work isn't than what it is. Um, and you know, there, there are all sorts of interesting arguments that I've had with people who want to define work a certain way. Um, in the last couple of years, this, this one person was using like a very Hannah Arendt definition. And I was like, well, what about reproductive labor? Um, cause he was very much like, well, work is like purpose of activity that creates something in the world. And I was like, is raising children, not purpose of activity that creates something in the world. Um, and whatever I think of Hannah Arendt, right. Those are sort of fun arguments to have. Um, and yeah, I mean, the fun thing about work is that it's really hard to define, but it's also, um, necessary to try to criticize this thing, even if it is a moving target, you know? So I was saying to somebody earlier that like, oh, there's this book I'm going to read and I'm really like looking forward to after I get done with this Zoom call, I'm going to get myself some dinner and then I'm going to read this book, which is like kind of work, right? In that I'm a writer and I'm always absorbing ideas from everywhere. And a lot of what I do ends up in my work, even though I'm technically reading this book for pleasure. Um, there are so many ways that the lines do get blurred. So what would it actually mean to have a world with less work? Um, which things might cease to be work? if we started to think about work from the point of view of say like the essential work is the, the, the buzzword of the pandemic, right? But what we think of as work, things that sort of have to be jobs now, because otherwise you can't justify doing them like making art, might be work for a lot fewer people in a different world, but a lot more people might have, if we made a better world, the opportunity to make art and make things. Um, I'm really obsessed with the um, community art centers 
that the US made during the Great Depression. And, you know, everybody sort of knows about the arts programs that the WPA had, right, where you paid, you know, famous artists to make things and make murals and take photos and, and all of that. But the, the best part of that whole thing actually was that they built community art centers so that everybody could go have a place to go make things, whether or not you were a professional artist who qualified as a professional artist to get WPA funding to go make your art. Um, and those are, I mean, I realize that I'm not defining anything at all here, which is kind of my point. Is it like the, how you define work is a political question that moves, sort of like gender. Okay, so this, this is returning to one of the questions that I had, which is that one of the things that comes up sort of, um, you know, like, uh, as like theoretical uh, sort of uh, explanations for a lot of the things that you're hearing from, from, from the people that you're interviewing and talking to are these sort of concepts, which are also, I think, hard, hard moving targets, hard to sort of define, um, even by the people who coined them sort of emotional labor and hope labor. And actually hope labor was one I hadn't heard before, which is, yeah. um, and so maybe you can talk and, but, but both of them sort of get at the effective ties that people have to yeah. work. And so maybe what, how do you see both of those terms, like, and that, that sort of like, yeah. what do they sort of get at in terms of our relationship to work that uh, might help us actually think through the answer to this question a little bit. So. Like, yeah, I mean, emotional labor has just become like this sort of big, vague, empty thing that basically a lot of people mean to just being like anything you do that you have feelings about is emotional labor, um, which I think is not a terribly useful definition. But again, like these things are moving targets. So when Arlie Russell Hochschild came up with the idea of emotional labor, she was studying flight attendants and was trying to sort of describe what it is to have to paste on a smile every day, no matter how you are feeling inside, in order to make sure that your customers are happy and taken care of and calm while they're on a plane, because the plane could crash and you need them to listen to you. Um, all of those things that you have to produce. And so I think thinking of emotional labor as something that produces an emotion in someone else um, is, for me at least, the most useful way to understand it as a concept that like, doesn't therefore just become really baggy and encompass everything. Um, picking up somebody's socks is not emotional labor. It's just it's just labor. It's just work, right? You're just cleaning the room. That's work. Um, we can just say that that's work. And um, hope labor is one that is really interesting because on the other side, as you're saying, it catches these things that might not be part of your job technically, but are very much part of your job anyway. So um, hope labor was defined by um, Kathleen Kuhn and Thomas Corrigan, who are communication scholars, and they were writing about essentially the work that people do in the hopes of getting hired to do it. So um, the social media manager that was on this call last night, um, who is a social media person for Pitchfork, um, was talking about, you know, the, the never ending a spillover of doing social media for your job that it literally, literally never turns off. And that's her doing it for her day job. But like, for me, being on Twitter is part of my job. If I disappear off social media, it will be harder to remind people that I am out there and a freelancer that they can give money in order to do some journalism. Um, I have to sort of promote the stories that I write. I have to sort of have a presence on these hell sites um, in order to have them be part of my job. And I did, you know, sort of get social media jobs early when I was working my way into journalism, um, got hired to be a social media person based on having been on Twitter a lot. Um, so things like that, unpaid internships are obviously like institutionalized hope labor, right? Um, but it can be all sorts of things that we do in order to hopefully get paid for it. Um, guy standing calls a similar thing sort of work for labor, right? So there are a few different ways that people have talked about this thing where because we are in this world now where we're supposed to be personally branded and blah, 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 all these horrifying terms that get thrown around, um, we kind of always have to be putting out this image that we are working or potentially working or making ourselves better in order to be better workers. Um, so, you know, at this point when there are like tweets from businesses that are like, go on vacation so you can be more productive. And it's like, 
Um, okay, great. Yeah. Um, I am not on Twitter to help my career, only to harm it, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. We met on Twitter. Um, uh, we okay, totally but, met on Twitter. Yes, we did also totally meet on Twitter. So um, <laughs> <laughs> look at this accidental hope labor we did. <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so again, a great, a lot of great questions coming into the queue. So I'm going to try to ask them. I'm not going quite in order because I'm trying to sort of pull a thread through them. So um, just if you ask your questions, uh, just be a little patient. Um, and but we'll get back to them if we don't start with them. So the the next question is from Claire. She asks, what do you see as the relationship between loving work, looking for meaning in it, and the politicization of workers, especially in the groups where we're seeing organizing happen, like among public school educators, higher education, cultural institutions, and digital slash tech? Is it the search for meaning in work and its resultant disillusionment that leads to politicization? And how do you respond to the argument that hardening the di divide between work and life has led to demobilizing or depoliticizing work as separate separated from work as it is related to a larger politics. I've never heard that argument. Honestly, this is the first time I've heard it. Um, so I don't really have a response to it other than it seems really wrong. Um, so there are a lot of different ways people get politicized around their jobs, right? Like during the pandemic, I talked to some workers at a Bojangles, which is a fast food chain in North Carolina, who went to work one day and there was a little tiny notice sort of hidden where they hoped they wouldn't see it, that one of their coworkers had COVID. And they were like, oh, hell no, and walked off the job. Um, two of them, just their own wildcat strike. Um, they ended up getting in touch with the fight for 15 because of that, because they were just sort of reaching out to anybody because they wanted to publicize their strike. So, you know, that is certainly not a job that they found a deep amount of meaning in. Um, and they were quite aware that they were treated like garbage on a good day. And at this point, they were just like, this was absolutely the last straw. Um, so there is that. And there is also people who worked at Google who were really, really excited and thrilled to go work at Google and thought they were working at the coolest place on earth. And then this James Damore memo lands in their lap. I just did a big story on tech workers. So this stuff is fresh in my mind. You know, so this this memo by one of their coworkers, who's this sexist jerk who is arguing that um, women can't code. And then a bunch of their coworkers are agreeing with this. And then they find out that like, oh, this isn't the greatest place to work at all, actually. Um, and that kind of thing, uh, Meredith Whitaker, who is a former um, Google employee and now runs the AI Now Institute at NYU, um, you know, she said like tech sort of went through this period of um, sort of asking the manager kind of organizing before they finally started organizing as workers. Because there was a lot of this feeling that like, no, our bosses are like us and they care about us and this will matter to them that this matters to us. And then when they found out that it didn't at all matter to them that, it, you know, they had to actually start organizing and now they have a Google union, which is growing, uh, has like 800 members, which is still, a, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction of Google's gigantic workforce, but it's 800 workers at Google who signed up to be dues paying members of a union and took it public. So I think, um, in terms of this question, like there is not any one way that workers get politicized on the job. Um, sometimes it's any number of things. And I think we would um, do a disservice to the, the idea of organizing to think that there's one way to do it. Great. Um, okay, this is from Emily. Um, I have been working to organize reproductive justice workers, abortion clinic workers, and other feminist industry workers. Um, how do we hold our organizations like Planned Parenthood accountable for their anti-union, anti-employee policies while making, while still making sure that we are protecting the movement? Many workers don't want to give the right wing any fodder. I think that this. Uh, um, Emily, if you've not picked up the book already, I do think there is a really great chapter on this, but I'll let Sarah talk more. Yeah, there is, there is exactly a chapter on this for this very reason, which is that, you know, I remember the first time I heard about Planned Parenthood workers unionizing, and it was really tough for them. And then also Planned Parenthood union busted the hell out of them. Um, and this is different Planned Parenthood affiliates because it's not sort of everything isn't run through the national chapter and there was you know a lot of um complications and different chapters have treated their workers differently but like in general Planned Parenthood's not a very good employer and um as of the New York Times writing a big feature story about this not that long ago they don't get family leave Planned Parenthood doesn't give family leave 
Um, and the, you know, the, the people who run it were basically saying, well, if we give our employees family leave, that it will hurt the patients. And that is the tension, but it's also the tension for the nurses who are on strike in um, Worcester right now, right? Um, it's also the tension for the teachers who were willing to strike to not have to go back into a classroom and get COVID. Um, that kind of, well, if you get halfway decent treatment, you will be hurting the people you're supposed to care about. Um, is just, you know, the, the way that the workers have done a good job with that, particularly teachers and also nurses, is like, we're actually striking to improve those conditions. We actually are organizing because we will do better at patient care at Planned Parenthood because we are not making 12 bucks an hour. We can actually pay our bills and we're not worried about our own health care. Um, and that, I think, is just like incredibly, incredibly important line to hold. And like, frankly, unions are guilty of this all the time too. Um, I've been waiting for certain staff unions, <clears throat> which keep getting close to striking to actually do it. Because it's like, the movements are absolutely important. And also the movement is not living up to its professed ideals if it's treating its workers like crap. And I will die on that hill. Um, I will absolutely die on that hill. I will piss off anybody that wants to be mad at me. I don't care. Planned Parenthood should be paying its workers better than 12 bucks an hour. Are you kidding me? Um, you know, and like the fact that, that Planned Parenthood appealed a union to the Trump NLRB is disgusting and they should be embarrassed. Um, and this just makes me really, really angry. Um, and so I wrote about it because a lot of people don't want to cover it because they are afraid of, of you know, hurting the movement. And I say that Planned Parenthood is the one who is hurting the movement when they treat their workers this way. Um, so I think that brings up a good, uh, sort of a good topic that I also wanted to ask about returning to one of my own sort of questions, which is um, particularly in these like care works, worker, like workers, and clients or workers uh, and or teachers and students, nurses, patients, um, you know, Planned Parenthood workers and, and, and their patients, like a lot of times these sort of even and I think even sometimes by the labor movement, it seems like these claims are made sometimes like like they can't be the same. Um, you know, like the interests can't be the same, right? Like the interest of the teacher can't be the same as the student, the interests of the, the, the Planned Parent worker can't be the same as the movement, even though those things are really bound up. So did I, you know, I sort of knew about that dynamic with um, teacher striking um, and how student, how a lot of times people who are, are, are critical of teachers unions uh, see it only as, as a sort of like, um, you know, teachers are only as workers and not as teachers when they sort of advocate for themselves. Was there anywhere that that popped up that surprised you? Um, uh, I guess I just didn't, you know, uh, I, I think in your chapter in domestic work that happened yeah. to you, which seems like that's like one to think through, but that was a place where I was like, oh, this is very similar. Um, any, any place that surprised you? At? Yeah, I think it's a real, it's a challenge in a lot of ways, right? Because like in so many of these cases, um, it is true that the teachers' needs and the students' needs are often very similar. Um, you know, one of the, the big tensions this year about reopening schools has been that, like, you know, people are saying, well, the students need to be back in school. And it's like, well, the students don't need to be back in school to the point where they die. Um, and they don't need their teachers dying. And they also don't need to be bringing COVID home to their parents, even if the students can't, don't necessarily get sick with it. They've got parents and grandparents who might. Um, and so, you know, these things. Um, what people think are their interests are not always their interests, which is another story. But like the way that um, this can get really messy, though, in the case of things like home care work, right, where, um, you know, legitimately, like there are interests that people who rely on home care attendants have in having like a limited amount of people who take care of them, not having just sort of strangers cycling through their house, um, all of these things that can sometimes be in tension with the needs of the the worker to have a life outside of their job. And these are really difficult questions because these are, are things where people really do have, you know, rights to be cared for, but also um, that sort of doesn't give you, that doesn't sort of transcend the other person's right to still be a person too. And so there are a lot of cases where I think um, 
we have to think about these things very carefully. And this is why thinking about sort of social reproduction and reproductive labor and care as a societal good and Margaret Thatcher being wrong about, you know, there being individual men and women and families. And we do live in a society, sorry, Maggie. Um, all of that's really important because it can actually help us pull apart some of these things that are really complicated. But ultimately, I'm, as I just sort of grumpily said, like, I will die on the hill that like, you have a right to say no to any work. And that I think is, is something that we, you know, it's so funny right now, right? Because like the big thing is like, oh, restaurant workers don't want to go back to work because unemployment insurance finally actually sort of gives them a living wage. Um, and having worked in restaurants for a real long time, it makes me really happy to think of the, you know, restaurants having to raise their wages and treat their workers better, finally. <laughs> it was great, please. Um, because, you know, and then there's this story today that was just like, so-and-so couldn't get employees to come work at her restaurant. And then she raised the wage she was offering and suddenly she got applications and it's like, no way. Who could have thought? Um, like we've gotten so deep into this, you must love your job and, and work is good and work is meaningful and all of the stuff that like, we can't wrap our brains around collectively the fact that like, if you can't get employees to come work at your shop for minimum wage, maybe you have to pay them more than minimum wage. Okay, this ties in really nicely to our next audience question, which is from Richard. Um, so do you feel like post pandemic, there's an opportunity to challenge these norms in and around work? And do you think that this is already actually happening? Um, I think you, it sounds like you think that there might also be, there already might be some movement, or do you think we've missed the opportunity and in doing so missing the chance to transform our society, like much like we missed in the post 08 financial crisis? Um, and uh, Richard apologizes for this uh, long winded question. It was not a long winded. That's not long winded at all. Um, so no, I, I, yeah, like opportunities sort of don't like we, we sort of love to have this idea that there's like a window in which we can do things and then that goes away. Um, and we don't, right? I'm, I'm taking this from like my friends and, and comrades who write about climate change, right? That it's like there's not some moment that we've gotten past that we just can't do anything now. Um, we can always change things and we always need to change things. And with climate crisis, particularly, we really need to change things like yesterday. Um, and this actually, these two things overlap really well. I talk about this a little bit in the end of the book about like, we actually have to drastically change the way we work because otherwise we're going to continue setting the planet on fire. And I would like for one, for that to not happen. Um, so this moment, um, you know, Arundhati Roy said, like, the pandemic is a portal, and I think that's great, but also, like, the portal doesn't just close, and then we're done, and now we're stuck in regular capitalism again, like, um, the crises are continuing, they're not going away, right, like, we might be getting vaccinated in the US, but India is in absolute nightmare crisis, and, like, maybe now we're gonna wave one vaccine patent waiver or something. I, I haven't had the time because I was on other calls before this to really look at the details of it. But like, you know, we're, we're in a moment where like rich countries can sort of um, pretend we can go back to normal, but we actually can't unless we actually make sure the whole world is vaccinated. That's just reality. Like we, we don't have a choice of back to normal. Um, and we just have a choice of sticking our heads in the sand and dying slightly later. Um, <laughs> just whatever today. Um, and like, so I think all that said, the pandemic gave us a few ways to think about things that are helpful. I think talking about essential work and actually realizing that this is not just like a, a neutral descriptor like all of these things these are sort of political definitions that are in tension that we have to fight over and we have to win um but also and i think of the um the workers at the ge air um airplane plant early on in the pandemic who went and picketed saying we want to make ventilators we don't want to make military aircraft in this moment we want to make things that will save lives because this is what is necessary and if you're going to make us keep coming to work and say we're essential workers let us do something that's actually essential um you know, that's one of one of my favorite pandemic stories of, of workers contesting what is essential work or the Amazon workers who would walk out and they were like, look, we don't mind delivering things that people need right now. We are fine with the fact that we're essential workers, but I don't want to die because you ordered a rubber chicken on the Internet, you know, 
Um, and they were right. They were also contesting this idea of which work is essential and what they should be asked to risk their lives for. Um, all of this, right? These are things that um, I think have opened some doors. And then also we've just seen that the government can mail us all checks, although I still haven't gotten my most recent one. But, you know, Donald Trump sent us all a $1,400 check or whatever it was. You know, okay, the government can send us all money. Um, in the COVID bill, this is my favorite thing that's been passed so far by the Biden administration is the, you know, the family al allowance that now is going to put checks in people's pockets. $3,000 a year per kid. Um, great. That like single-handedly undoes all of the garbage that they did with welfare reform. Now you're just giving kids money, giving their parents money. Great. We need to make that permanent and then expand it rapidly. But like, you know, these things that we thought we could never do, that we were told were absolutely impossible, turns out we can do. Turns out Trump could do. So we can definitely do it with a, you know, slightly more competent government now. Um, and I think those are the things that we have to sort of hold on to and not think like, oh, but the window's closed now, like with the, the you know, the big bill has passed, um, Joe Manchin is in charge, whatever, like, we actually have to hold on to the fact that like, they did a whole bunch of things, you know, these cities just put people in homes. Turns out we can solve homelessness, you just, you just do it. You just put people in homes. Um, and yeah, those are things that like, we might not be in that phase of the crisis, but we also can vary, we can hang on to the fact that they were done and we can do them again. Okay, I'm gonna ask you another look into your crystal ball kind of <laughs> I don't have a crystal ball. So this is from Amy and she thinks, she says, thanks for these great provocations. Question, if work goes away in our better remade world, what happens to education? In an economy where so much learning is currently geared towards earning, it feels like your book would also help us reimagine learning and recast uh, of the very idea of achievement along with productivity. So um, I guess, what, what does the sort of remaking of work mean for, the, for education in particular? God, like so many of the educators that I talk to, too, are always trying to figure out ways to do education that isn't just about geared towards work, right? Um, that are trying to talk about like educating the whole child and like doing, you know, I mean, this is the big fight over the neoliberal university, right? Is like, are we creating universities as spaces for inquiry where we can have nerdy conversations like this for the fun of it um, and hopefully change the world? Or are we creating universities in order to create scientific research that then Pfizer can patent and not sell to people in India while they die? Um, and um, all of the other things and, and, you know, pumping out people with credentials so that they can get better jobs. And yeah, I think we're like, I, I take my cues on this from just the teachers and, and in, you know, K through 12 and also higher ed who are fighting this every day in their classrooms, right? To say that like, this is about more than how much these kids are going to earn. Um, all the fighting against like standardized testing, especially like the ridiculousness of doing standardized testing in a pandemic. Um, yeah, we know it's been really hard. <laughs> Why do you need to test the kids right now? Um, that, that like, yeah, that these things should already be about so much more than they're, they are, and they've been so narrow. And I was talking about this with the, the New Yorker folks last night, the way that like the first thing that gets cut from schools these days is arts and music, right? Um, the things that like, oh, you don't really need those because you just need to get a job and those aren't jobs, except they are jobs, but like, <laughs> um, yeah, so like setting these things free from this idea that like they're only there to give us credentials to get better jobs um, is again, it's a, a fight that people are having constantly. And I think it's it's so important. And I'm just like, I love it. The people who are doing that are doing amazing work all the time. Probably lots of you on this call. Um, so I think that we probably are a little um, overrepresented in folks who are in <laughs> I'm discussing. Um, so I wanted to ask, you have a whole chapter called Prof uh, Pro Proletarian Professionals about academia and labor conditions in academia. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, what, uh, what do you think the sort of like 
uh, an academic who's reading their book and thinking about their work, what, what would you want them to glean from the, the um, you know, you, you tell a story particularly of, of adjunctification and, and grad mm. work struggle, but, but what, what, what would you want someone to sort of get out of your, um, your uh, account of academia? See, all I'm doing right now is just like quoting all the interviews I've done this week. Literally right before I got on this call, I was talking to Todd Wolfson, who is, um, among other things, involved with the Mike Center, which is Penn and Rutgers. But um, he's also the president of the Rutgers Faculty Union. And we were talking about their fight this year to prevent layoffs at Rutgers. And so this was, they ended up building a big coalition of academic workers from the faculty on down to building staff and and basically every unionized worker on the campus um, to avoid job cuts. And one of the things that the professors did was they said, anybody who makes over a certain amount of money, we're willing to take cuts so that the lower paid workers don't. And that's a thing that I would love for uh, <laughs> some professors to take away. It's like, you could have better solidarity with the people on campus who don't make as much as you. Um, I was reading things about professors having their students cross the picket lines at NYU and the students who were said, I am not taking this test that you were going to grade while scabbing on our grad assistant because stop that. Um, so this is fresh on my mind right now. Um, but yeah, I think one of the things about um, the chapter on academia and I was sort of picking two fights with that one right one is that like academic work is still work and the other one is like this terrible discourse around the professional managerial class that really just needs to die in a fire because everybody's wrong. Um, and it was to talk about the way that like work that was formerly stable and, and what Stanley Arano it's called the last good job in America is increasingly not and like not to depress grad students, but it's, you know, what are the odds of getting a full time tenure track job when you get out of grad school, they are very slim. Um, I remember seeing something recently that like only like 50% of Yale humanities PhDs get a job and it's like that's Yale man like you know this is Penn like what happens to people who get their PhD from a state school, which is also still really good and really like, doing a PhD is really hard, no matter where you do it. But like even the prestige ladder that gets you from Yale to whatever still might not get you anything close to a job. Um, and to think about like what that means and that, you know, as you said, ties in perfectly to the last question is like, what have we created universities to be? And how has that shifted and who's who's running them and running them into the ground in many cases these days and what are the things that they want to gain from it and and you know and just because i'm thinking about the vaccine thing a lot like how many academic workers worked on the science that went into these vaccines that was done in a massive collective global scientific effort that then got patented by this handful of companies um you know, is this the way we want to live? Or can we think of this differently? And yeah, so I don't know, that's a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of things, but. Um, okay, great. I'm going to change tax a little bit so we can get in more audience questions. Um, this one is, um, I'm really interested in your answer to this actually, and it's from Osman. In addition to speaking to the workplace as a family, many bosses try to obscure the exploitative aspects of work through gamification or efforts to make work fun. Um, can you speak to this dimension of work? Hi, Osman. Um, so yeah, I gamification makes my head explode. It just like infuriates me. Like the fact that like Amazon has like little games on their little scanners for people who work in the warehouse and like Uber wants to gamify being a taxi driver. Um, it's really infuriating, but also right. Like it's, it's really built into this sort of ideology of tech, right. That like, um, the term I, I steal from somewhere in the book is, is playbur, right? This idea that like, it's not really work, it's playbur, it's, it's fun. While you're doing it, it's all fun. Um, except once again, most of the time it's not. And, you know, that sort of tech workplace, I was really fascinated by this whole sort of thing of like, the tech workplace is really fun and there's games and toys and like you can you know hang out till whatever and you can play video games at your desk and then go back to working and like it's all just designed so you never leave basically um 
and like the games workers are, are some of the worst about this, right? They're just like, oh my God, we work hundred hour weeks on the way up to like launching a game and our bosses are just like, but it's fun. It's like, no, it's not, I haven't slept. Um, and so all of these sort of trappings of these workplaces are designed to sort of make them feel less like a workplace and make them feel more like home or your friend's house that you're just hanging out at with your buddies. And therefore, um, it's not work. And therefore you forget that you're working when you're still there at 10 PM at night and you've got a home cooked meal, except it's not home guys. It's not home. Like one of the websites for one of the games companies, um, was just like, we have a home cooked meal every Friday. And it's like, no, you don't. You have a workplace cooked meal every Friday with paid chefs. It's not home. Like, but all of it is sort of designed to blur these lines in these ways that, um, is also really gendered, frankly, like these, these are workplaces. Um, Kate Lossie's memoir of her time at Facebook is called The Boy Kings. And that's like absolutely the way these, these places are designed, right? They're designed for essentially teenage boys. Um, they're assigned, designed to sort of shepherd like guys from graduating from college or grad school or whatever into the workplace and that just sort of takes over so like the workplace ends up being some combination of your mom and your wife and then if you want to actually at some point like have a family of your own because we're always getting back to this family pension um a lot of the games workers for instance like quit they leave the industry so it's just this endless sort of turnover of 25 year old white men um and then, you know, when they hit 30 and they decide that they would like to have some more time, um, they go work in fintech or something terrible like that. Um, and yeah, I mean, all of this stuff is so deeply embedded in this particular sector, but of course it spreads because like tech is trying to get into every sector of the economy and they think that, you know, turning work into a game like ooh, like mechanical turk is is a game it's fun you're you're just dicking around on the internet and you're getting paid it's great it's not really like work except like you're creating a whole bunch of value for people um by you know doing micro tasks and yeah it ends up being so insidious and it all just sort of serves to reinforce this idea that work is fun and work is exciting and if you don't like your job there's something wrong with you Um, okay. Uh, yes, that I, uh, I, that is sort of, I have, uh, I saw like a little bit of this sort of like game before I went to graduate school, the sort of way that gamification bleeds into like a lot of other jobs. Um, and, uh, you know, it is more fun when it's a game, but it's also, <laughs> but right. Um, uh, okay. We have another question from Claire. Um, how is the family and its assumption of stable roles, emotional event investment, and often unconditional love reconciled or not with the fact that the modern workforce has become so highly contingent? Does this discrepancy make labor organizing easier or harder? Oh, goodness. I mean, I don't think like anyone thing sort of makes labor organizing easier or harder, obviously, but like, um, I think the way that work often doesn't live up to people's expectations, um, you know, can be a great thing to sort of organize around. Um, you know, like one of the games workers said to me, you know, they, cause games is notorious also for just having mass layoffs pretty regularly. Um, he's like, you know, what if I moved across the country to, to work at this company and you've told me I've joined the family and then you're laid off three weeks after you've told me I joined the family. Um, you know, the, the, the space between what we've been promised and what we get is a useful space for, for politics in a lot of ways, right? Um, although sometimes it can go in really reactionary directions, witness the entire Donald Trump supporting movement. Um, it doesn't necessarily produce progressive results, but it definitely um, produces anger. <laughs> and um, hopefully good organizers can, can direct that anger. Um, but I think, you know, as we were talking about before also that like the family is really unstable and more and more and more people are experiencing the family as really unstable, um, you know, in, in a lot of our lives, um, and the family being a thing that like 
you know, again, like I, I, I sort of joke about like, right, like when, when your boss says the workplace is a family, it's like, oh, okay, so it's a hierarchically structured place where a lot of us do a bunch of unpaid work and don't get credit for it. That, yeah, yeah, workplaces are a lot like the family. Um, the expectation of unconditional love is, of course, what they're trying to evoke by talking about the workplace as a family. Um, and again, I think that the useful bit of that is when like those Google workers or like the Toys R Us workers, you realize that your work does not in fact love you back, which is why I called my book that. <laughs> um, so how do we move beyond this Puritan work ethic, the live to work, um, and, and love to work ethic, I would add um, to this yep. uh, question. Um, and this question is from Al, I should say. When even, you know, uh, Senator Warren justifies government care, child care subsidies in terms of enabling mothers to be productive members of society. So what, um, you know, how do we, how do we sort of change change a lot of the things that we want to when even sort of more progressive politicians um, still use the sort of, uh, the, the idea of being a productive worker as like the, yeah. the end all be all, or like even, you know, I think that you can still say like, there's still this idea that we could get back to a family wage, you know, like, and that's mm -hmm. sort of yeah. some progressive rhetoric too. Yeah. So how, uh, so how do we start to move beyond this, I guess? Um, and I think that you've partially maybe answered this, but maybe go a little bit. Yeah, more. no, there's, there's a couple of like, the nitpicky thing I would say is we actually don't have the Puritan work ethic anymore. The, the labor of love shtick is actually very different from the Puritan work ethic. In the Puritan work ethic, work was supposed to suck and you were supposed to do it anyway to be a good person, right? Like the, the, um, the Max Weber argument, again, I'm not a political theorist, so Miranda could probably correct me on this, but basically Max Weber's argument is that people worked in a calling because they couldn't tell if they were predestined to go to hell or not, but they had to act like they were gonna go to heaven. So you did it and you were supposed to work to be good. And whether you liked it was sort of out of the question. And even like my father was a little bit like this. He was a small business person and he was very much like, yeah, whether you like it is not the point. You just do it because you have to do it. And um, that, you know, but that sort of only applied to certain people. Like it is the petty bourgeois work ethic sort of um, epitomized, but like the industrial work ethic, which was built around this family wage, right? These things is an argument again, that like your job probably sucks, but it has to pay you decently and you get time off and you get some acknowledgement that um, your work is work, right? Um, and then the sort of destruction of industrial labor in you know countries like the US brings us to this point now where we actually have a form of capitalism that doesn't need as many people as it used to um globally right there are fewer people working in manufacturing even though plenty of people are still working in manufacturing um and the gaps are being filled in with service work and those jobs as we were talking about restaurant workers often don't pay people enough to live on but also like we don't you know we've had sustained high unemployment for a while now and pervasive underemployment on um, people like Aaron Bananov have made this argument really persuasively, right? That like actually the, the real feature of most people's lives globally is this sort of pervasive underemployment of never being able to get enough work. Um, and so this is like why the, the whole labor of love shtick is so like abusive in a way, right? Is it like for most people, they can't even get enough work to live, let alone to enjoy it and find meaning in it. And yet we are sort of bullied about, you know, again, like somebody mentioned before, I think we went live with the call, the Amazon, um, you know, ads for warehouse jobs that are like, it's fun and it's exciting. And there's a big billboard off the New Jersey Turnpike that says, um, get a job delivering smiles. And it's like, working in an Amazon warehouse is terrible. Everyone I've talked to who's worked in an Amazon warehouse hates it. Um, it's miserable. It's grinding. There's a little thing strapped to your wrist that beeps if you stop working. Um, it's just like the, the biopolitics of the Amazon warehouse are so intense. Um, so, you know, but, but you're supposed to like it. And that I think is, is actually different from the Puritan work ethic. Um, and it weirdly does give us, a, as we were saying with the last question, like a little bit of space to maneuver in that. Um, and, you know, I just think politicians 
are bad at talking about this stuff in a lot of ways. And like, uh, you know, I, Elizabeth Warren is a, of a certain generation. And like, you know, Elizabeth Warren it, it was a midlife convert to progressive politics. So like, I'm glad we have her, but she still sort of, you know, is raised in this very particular, um, you know, way of talking about work and this this generation of feminism that frankly, right, like saw getting a job outside of the home as the way women were going to be liberated from the home. And because as we've discussed, the family is a style of work. Um, and there was another option even then, which is why we've talked about the wages for housework movement that people said, like, actually, we're already doing work. And for a lot of people, you know, Selma James made this point over and over that like for a lot of people who might go get jobs, they were not going to get exciting, meaningful careers. They wouldn't get to do, you know, conversations at Penn talking about the books they wrote. They would be doing a version of the work they were already doing in the home for minimum wage. And this is what happened with welfare reform, right, is that you kicked off um, hundreds of thousands of women off of any support who were already at home taking care of children and doing work. And then you just forced them into doing a version of that work somewhere else. So they went into fast food, they went into home care. Um, these are the places where those women ended up finding paid work if they did move into the workforce successfully and didn't just get royally screwed because their benefits cut off after two years. So this is why the family benefit is really exciting and we should all be fighting for it, even if like me, you are a childless hag. <laughs> which is, I say that as a point of pride, but um, I think fighting for that and fighting for the fact that that is work is really important. And to, you know, sort of counter the Elizabeth Warren thing, um, Ilhan Omar, um, in response to somebody's tweet that was like, doesn't this undo all of the work requirements in welfare? She just retweeted that like card thing, which like, a you know, it's like the night of whatever from a deck of cards. And it was just like, yes. And I was like, I love her so much. So, you know, I think it's not an accident that the, the faces of the left in American electoral politics right now are young women of color, and that's awesome. Okay, so um, our next question is from Gabe, and I think I understand it, but I will maybe ask for clarification. So do you think that the problems with work take a particular form or are just more intense in the US American context? I am thinking of Du Bois's claim that there is an American assumption that through hard work, anyone can become a capitalist and how that makes labor organizing more difficult. Um, and for clarification, that American assumption is an idea that comes out of Black Reconstruction as part of the reason yep. why Black like why reconstruction failed um, was not just like, you know, it's this, anyway. Um, so that, 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 that that's sort of where it's placed is that this, that this is actually like a really sort of like ideologically long thread to be pulling through. Yeah. And are there examples from other countries that you think can be useful to us here? I'm thinking you already, you do cover the UK and Canada um, in particular, I'm thinking maybe uh, if you have other ideas of like, you know, what is, is the American example unique? Is there that American assumption that's absent from other places? Um, are there models that we should be looking to? Um, yeah, so I, I, with this book, I wanted to make sure that I covered some places outside of the US because I wanted to make clear that I think that this is a problem of sort of post-industrial countries in this period of capitalism and that said the us has exported a lot of these things like unpaid internships are an american invention that now exists everywhere there are unpaid interns making iphones in the foxconn factories in china um so you know we have exported a whole lot of this stuff um i did a talk a few weeks ago for the rethinking economics India network and they, you know, a lot of those folks were like, oh yes, we still have this experience, very much so. Um, and I do think there are obviously sort of different cultures of work in different um, parts of the world. The French still have a riot every time somebody tries to um, take away the 35 hour work week and I love them for it. Um, the first time I went to Italy and I was trying to go to this museum, I was there for a conference and I was trying to go to this museum, but it was closed for two hours in the middle of the day. And I was like mad at first and I was like, no, wait, this is awesome. I love that this country shuts everything down in the middle of the day so everybody can like go home, have lunch and a nap. This is wonderful. We should, we should steal that. Um, but in most of those countries, that culture is going away, right? Um, in Spain and Italy, there is 
increased pressure to not do that. And that, that's, you know, that's sort of clung to in some places, but it is increasingly, you know, considered unproductive. And this is why, you know, Macron keeps trying to take away the 35 hour work week in France. Um, you know, Germany's sectoral bargaining model of unionism um, is under pressure. Like the, the global pressure has been for more places to look more like the US. Um, and that's why it's sort of both important for like us to get it together here, but also um, to understand that like this is, you know, that, that it's a global system and, and therefore like these are, are things that are um, pressures that are being applied in a lot of the world. Great. Um, okay, we have one more question on queue. I have one more question myself. If I think we could probably have one more question if someone wanted to get in very quickly from the audience. Um, but Drew wants to know your thoughts on how we tie social benefits, healthcare welfare, earned income tax credit, and tax refunds for childcare to work. Um, since it seems like it must create a work environment where employees have even greater leverage over workers. And I wonder if maybe that's a good moment for comparison too, because again, I think that this is not the case in, in, in everywhere that you, uh, you've maybe taken time to look at. Yeah, I um, did the Axios podcast early on when the book came out and the um, podcast host was really mad at me because he was like, but, but if we give people like good unemployment benefits and they won't work. And like, if people can get sick time for anything, then they can just say that they're sick all the time. And I was like, you say that, like, it's a bad thing, <laughs> like, you know, um, it, the same thing as I'm saying about the restaurants, right? It's like, oh, if restaurants can't get employees because people would rather, you know, live on still meager unemployment benefits, then cool, then you have to improve your workplace. So yeah, I mean, we should apply none of this to work. One of the reasons that I'm so excited about the child tax credit payments is that like, we've had a child tax credit for a really long time, right? This makes it refundable so that it will actually get to the hands of the people who really need it, who are the people who don't pay income taxes because they don't make enough money to pay income taxes. So, you know, things like the earned income tax credit, it's, you know, they, they miss the people who really need it because we don't make them into payments. We make them um, just deductions at the end of the year. And like that requires you to, you know, pay an accountant however much you pay an accountant in order to do your deductions. And that requires you to make enough money to do this anyway. Um, in other words, they mostly don't happen. So you have um, an entire system and particularly in the US because healthcare is tied to employment that gives employers like tremendous, tremendous leverage um, and also gives romantic partners tremendous leverage because a lot of people who don't get employer um, an insurance through their employer get it through a partner's employer. And so that's also pressure that's holding families together that maybe shouldn't be together. Um, so all of these things, you know, create intense pressure and intense leverage that a boss has over not just one person, but that person's entire extended family by extension. So yeah, bosses have way too much power, um, but particularly the fact that that um, what Lane Wyndham calls like this really sort of um, public private welfare state that we've always had in this country that um, among other things is sort of was won by a portion of the workforce basically because of unions and then busting the unions has also destroyed the welfare state because it was never public in the way that it is in the UK, even though Boris Johnson wants to destroy it there too. Okay, great. Um, so here's my last question for you. Um, you know, we are at a st uh, center for the study of democracy and your book sort of ends with thinking about like sort of various ways of reclaiming our time from work and rethinking work as emancipatory um, forms of politics. So I'm wondering specifically, um, given our, uh, our, our sort of um, digital uh, space right now, what kind of democratic practices would be improved by this sort of like rethinking of work or anti-work politics? And how does this rethinking work reshape everything, but maybe particularly um, political horizons and uh, sort of like how we think about participation in politics in a number of different ways. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that that union nerds like me say all the time, right, is that like the union is an attempt to have democracy in the workplace. Um, and that is true and very important. And, you know, it's it's not a unique observation in the slightest to say that, you know, the workplace is the place where we experience unfreedom 
more than anywhere else in most of our lives, unless we are unfortunate enough to run into the criminal legal system. So we, like, we actually have a real, real interest if we think that we should have democratic control over more of our lives in making the workplace a focus of those efforts. And this is also true because like right now, the biggest threats to democracy, um, other than, you know, the political parties themselves who are trying to do things like ban giving water to voters, um, trying to, they did do that in Georgia. <laughs> they didn't try. It's a, it's a, it's a law. Uh, you cannot give water to voter, people voting in line. And then in Florida, you can, you know, legally run protesters down with your car. So other than the politicians who are trying to do this, the other big threats are these massive multinational tech companies who are, by the way, you know, super intertwined with the government at all levels um, and also have, you know, unprecedented levels of control at all types of things. And so, like, if we are concerned about democracy, we should be concerned about Jeff Bezos. And one of the best ways to limit the power of Jeff Bezos is supporting the hell out of all of the workers at Amazon who are still organizing. They didn't stop just because the Bessemer vote didn't succeed. Um, and so, you know, this is, these are ways to think about the people who exercise power in all of our lives um, and the way that those people are employers in almost all senses, that means that one of the ways we can exercise some power back is screwing up their capital accumulation. And the easiest way to do that is if you work for them. Okay, great. Um, that was a totally different answer than I was expecting, which also was like, but a great right. one. I was thinking about the amount of time you could give to politics too. Um, yeah, well, yeah, sure. Yes. Sort of um, okay, we have actually a little bit more time. So I'm going to ask you one more question, okay. which is one I'm curious about, and then we'll, we'll wrap and I'll remind people of, of where you, they can get your book and everything like that. So one, uh, so the, your first chapter chapter is actually about universal basic income in the UK, uh, which I found to be extremely exciting because I am, I, I am very interested in that sort of um, academically, but um, and this is maybe sort of similar to the, the to the question that um, our audience member uh, Emily asked about, you know, how do you do something without hurting the movement? And one of the things is that UBI is actually, you know, there's like a sort of right wing UBI and a left wing UBI. And so how do you make the fight for universal basic income in the United States when now UBI has sort of the face of Andrew Yang, whereas mm. in like the UK, there's actually a, quite a lot of black grass or at least uh, maybe it's just I, like, I predominantly know people who are involved in that in the UK, but there does seem to be actual grassroots movements for universal basic income. So that's sort of my last question. It's a little bit off the beaten track, but um, just how do we approach UBI in the US if there's a way to do that? Vote against Andrew Yang if you're in New York. Oh my God. <laughs> he becomes mayor of New York. I'm just going to have nightmares forever. Um, and I moved out of New York a while ago, but I still really don't want Andrew Yang to be mayor of New York. Anyway, okay, aside from my political arguments, um, it is interesting though, because Andrew Yang just put out a proposal for a universal basic income in New York, which is like a thousand dollars a year that is not universal and is paid for, of course, by cutting other services, because of course it is, because Andrew Yang is bad. Um, but, you know, the conversation around basic income, I think, again, like we, we, we got one this year, right? We got a one-time check. It's already more than Andrew Yang's going to give New Yorkers. Um, or we got a few of them. I only got one. Anyway, that's another story. Um, the, you know, we have seen now that the government can send people money. And so, um, again, I think that's a huge opening. Um, there's more organizing, actually, like even in like Spain is talking about because, um, you know, the, the coalition government includes Podemos, um, along with sort of the left leadership of the, um, I always forget what the initials are in Spanish, anyway, the Socialist Party, essentially. Um, they've actually talked about things like a four-day week, um, basic income, stuff like that. Um, folks I know are doing basic income studies in Wales. Um, you know, there's, there's real conversations about this. I mean, there was, there were more of them when there was a leadership of the Labour Party that wasn't terrible, but we're back to a terrible leadership of the Labour Party. So, um, sorry guys. Um, but, you know, basic income trials and the four day week were part of the last Corbyn platform. Um, and yeah, and I, I think, I also think that, you know, the shorter working hours and basic income, um, should definitely go together. But the, the way that, um, you know, there is this sort of, 
again, it, it, talking about like Facebook and companies as threat to democracy, like there is a way that these companies just want to like give people just enough money that you can keep buying things from Amazon and paying for, you know, Netflix and then nothing else, the bare minimum of, of sort of, you know, acceptable life. And um, they all want us to be able to remotely work so that they don't have to worry about making cities livable. They can just, you know, hire people who live in, you know, I'm in central Pennsylvania right now. It's a lot cheaper to live here than it was to live in New York City um, or even Philadelphia. And um, yeah, that's a really like dystopian vision of the world. And so um, I think one of the things to, to think about in terms of like the same way that like we need to separate benefits from work, we need to separate income from work. And that's, that's you know, actually really important. People should have the right to, to have a life. Um, Kathy Weeks calls it the politics of getting a life, right? Um, and I think that's great. But I think that like the tech overlords, you know, are really happy with a sort of Wally -E kind of world where we all just order things and push buttons. Although as Malcolm Harris notes, like the end, end result of sort of, you know, Jeff Bezos's idea of perfect efficiency isn't Wally, -E, it's the matrix. It's all of us just plugged in like little human batteries. Um, and so, you know, they will always try to give people the minimum that they can that prevents their colossal accumulated wealth from being taken away. So um, I guess all of that is to say, like, beware of tech bros bearing gifts and please don't vote for Andrew Yang. Okay, on that note, we will um, <laughs> uh, beware of tech bros bearing gifts. Um, <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you so much for Sarah Jaffe for joining us. Her book, um, uh, Won't Work, Work Won't Love You Back. It's very hard for me to say for some reason. I just want to say <laughs> yeah. Work Won't Love You Back, but Work Won't Love You Back, published by Bold Type Books, is available on their website and reputable booksellers everywhere. I think it was dropped into the chat, um, the link for the book. Uh, so if you'd like to pick it up, I'd also like to thank Matthew Ross and Jeffrey Green from the Andrea Mitchell Center for Democracy for hosting us um, so spectacularly. And finally, I'd like to make a small plug for any Penn graduate students who are interested in labor or study it. The organization Get Up is a group of grad students across schools at Penn who are interested in grad students' rights as workers. If you're interested in talking with your peers about grad student labor at Penn, email the organization at pengetup at gmail.com. Follow them on Twitter at getupgrads or um, fill out their interest form on their website, getupgrads.org. And so with that, um, uh, Professor Green does not need to uh, take the mic back, but we will end. Um, thank you all so much for being here and for asking questions. Um, and we'll see you next year. Thanks for having me.